Hi, my name is Isabel Scherl, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how robust principal component analysis can be used for modal decompositions of fluid flows. So this work was recently accepted and will be uh, published in Physical Review Fluids, and all of the code associated with what's presented here is available on my GitHub. So breaking down this title, because it's quite a mouthful, I'm going to start with the principal component analysis, or PCA, aspect of this work. So Principal component analysis, also known as proper orthogonal decomposition, or POD, will look, will take a flow field or a data set and decompose it into a set of modes. And these modes are ordered hierarchically in terms of how much energy they possess. And for this canonical cylinder flow field, which is often used for, as an example, it is an efficient representation of the flow field because 99% of the energy associated with this flow can be represented in the first 10 modes. So this is a great method that's used in a variety of fields and in a variety of applications, but it tends to start to break down when sparse noise is introduced. And that's an, uh, commonly, a common issue in uh, fluids. So oftentimes our flow fields don't look like that perfect cylinder flow field, they look a little bit like more like this one, where they're messy and they have sparse noise. Um, but what we want to do is we want to decompose this into a low rank um, space and identify that sparse noise so that we can get these more accurate, accurate represent representations of our flow fields. So the way we want to do this is to use a method that was previously developed in robust statistics called robust principal component analysis. And robust principal component analysis can take a data set that has low rank structure and identify the sparse noise. So here, the example shown is the eigenfaces data set, where the faces all have low rank structure. They all have eyes, nose, and a mouth. And Robust principal component analysis is able to take that and identify that this mustache is sparse and that it is noise and that it is not, it's a disguise. It's not really part of the faces. And so this sparse noise is able to be identified and the method is able to um, see this face and identify the face instead. So that low rank face is evident and that sparse is sort of um, separated out. So what we are actually doing, and more explicitly, or mathematically, is we want to identify um, an L and an S matrix that, where the L matrix has minimal rank and the S matrix is as sparse as possible. And by sparse, we, want, we mean that we want it to have as few non-zero components as possible. That means that most of the components of S are zero. But where we are identifying sparse noise, those components are non-zero. Since the rank of L and the zero norm of S are both non-convex, we relax this to solve the following, where we are minimizing the Frobenius norm of L and the one norm of S, and we introduce this parameter lambda, or lambda naught, as shown here, where we have lambda naught equals one over the max of the dimensions of X. And to be explicit, the dimensions of X um, are, the columns are the spatial dimensions. So each row in the matrix X is a spatial dimension, and each column represents one component in time, um, or one iteration in time. Ideally, lambda would be equal to one, uh, according to the original method. But since many of our data sets do not exactly follow that they have low rank structure with uncorrelated sparse noise. We use this as a tuning parameter um, to get accurate results. So keeping that in mind, uh, if we have this lambda data set, if we have this flow past the cylinder data set, and we want to change lambda, if we make lambda too small, then everything is allocated to the sparse space and the rank is too low. If we make lambda too large, there's no noise reduction, and everything is con considered low rank, and the rank is too high. If we get lambda just right, we have this perfect bisection between low rank structure and sparse noise, and that's what we're aiming for. This is a really nice example, but this noise is, is sort of ideal. Um, it's 
completely sparse and uncorrelated and somewhat unrealistic. Instead, what we're going to look at is how this changes if we have uh, noise that's biased towards regions of high vorticity. This is a little bit more realistic for many of our actual flow fields that we're measuring because regions of high vorticity are often of interest and often very difficult to measure because of their three-dimensional nature. So even though it looks like in the sparse space um, all the way down there, it looks like there's structure in there, it's because the noise is correlated with those regions, and those regions are more likely to have salt and pepper noise. So now we're going to move on to the modal decomposition aspect of this. So if we have, if we want to look at the modal decompositions of this X matrix and this L matrix, then what we want to do is we want to compare them to the true modes. So if we have the true modes, and then we compare the PCA modes, um, we can see that they're pretty much incoherent and very difficult to interpret. There isn't much structure there. There's somewhat of a structure in the mean field in the first mode, but beyond that, um, there's not much there. If we compare this to the RPCA modes, then we can see that there's some structure there. There's some coherent structure, and it starts to match the true modes. However, um, it's, they're still a little bit fuzzy. And this is only for two periods of vortex shedding being analyzed. If we increase that from two periods to five periods, we see improved results. Um, but not for the PCA modes. The PCA modes are still pretty much incoherent. So, but for the RPCA modes, we can see that the, they're much clearer and um, uh, have that same structure that's evident in the true modes. This is a nice qua quantitative a qualitative example, but if we want to look at this a little bit more quantitatively, we can see that the PCA modes, um, if we look at the DMD eigenvalues, that the, that the PCA DMD eigenvalues are all clustered toward the origin. That means that they're artificially damped, whereas the true modes are on the unit circle because these, they're these oscillatory modes that, are, that shouldn't be uh, damped. And that's shown in the RPCA modes, where once we get past a single period of vortex shutting being analyzed, the DMD eigenvalues are on the unit circle. So now if we look at a cylinder PIV example, so this is an actual flow past a cylinder measured um, at Reynolds number 413, we sort of see similar trends, where if we make lambda too low, low um, the rank is too low. If we make lambda too high, there's minimal noise reduction, but we have this happy medium that has this nicer bisection. However, uh, it's not exactly clear what this value should be, and there's a trade-off uh, between having structure in your sparse matrix and having noise reduction. If we look at those same modes, we can see that the PCA modes um, and the RPCA modes at a low lambda value have degrade very quickly. So after the fifth mode for this case at this low lambda value, since lambda is so low rank, uh, there isn't any structure. And that does not, and that's not right. If we make lambda larger, you can see that the structure is more persistent and that we have uh, structure at higher modes. And you can see that if you look at the singular values for each one of these case, cases, where the light blue shows the RPCA modes at lambda equals 0 0.1, where they have this stark drop buff. And we speculate that this method could be used, that looking at these singular values could be used to determine what your optimal va value of lambda is, but that would be future work. So finally, we're going to look at this sort of example that we use just to look at this method and see how it performs on data that we actually care about. So we have this cross-flow turbine where we have a frame, and we're looking at the wake. And here we're looking at the U-velocity, and or the, free, or the streamwise velocity. And you can see that there are these regions of higher velocity um, shown in yellow and cyan. And the white measurements are missing measurements. So here we're treating those corrupt measurements, um, those missing measurements as corrupt measurements. And if we look at the traditional PIV processing pipeline, which is shown here, where the first frame is the cross-correlated frame, then ve vector validation is performed, and then finally interpolation, you can see the traditional processing. 
But it's very hard to interpolate when you're missing many measurements uh, that are local, locally. Because if you don't have any local information, then you're interpolating from points that are very far away. So instead, what we propose is to use that global information and use RPCA instead of interpolation. And if you look at the phase median for each one of these cases, they look very similar. Where they differ is if you look at the, and just to be clear, since this is a periodic wake, that this is a structure that is passing through, and this is the same phase. So this is the median at every point of this phase. And if you look at the standard deviation at each point at this phase, you can see that for the traditional PIV processing, the interpolated case, there are all of these really dark spots, which means that the, this region is very inconsistent from, uh, for each iteration, for each, uh, at each period. Whereas the RPCA is much smoother, and that's very promising. So that's all I have to share for you. Um, and the this again, this work is available on archive, and it is the code associated with this is on my GitHub. But just to summarize, I want to say that this is a pretty efficient method to use that you can use on your data set. It's based on the SVD also, and it's um, all of if you want to try this out, please check out my GitHub. Thank you.